That's right. Sometimes we do. That's right. So continuing our series in the book of Judges, many fallen people, one faithful God. And today we're going to look right there. And we're going to see that he was a man, like many political leaders throughout history, promised a better future for his people and his people if he gets into power. That's the key. We're also going to see that he too is just as corrupt as many of the political leaders that we've seen throughout history and today. And how God, in his perfect justice, deals with those who persist in a pathway of sin and self-destruction. So, uh, Judges 9, verse 1. Then, like son of Jeroboam, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem, and said to them, and to all his mother's clan, Ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you? Have all seventy of Jeroboam's son rule over you, or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. When the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow them away, for they said, He is related to us. So Abimelech, he was one of Gideon's seventy sons. That's right, seventy sons. Gideon had seventy sons. Uh, we remember also. See, Jeroboam, Gideon, well, that was his other name, of course, Jeroboam. Uh, that we all deal with him, is what that means. So, Abimelech uh, is one of Gideon's sons, one of the 70 sons, and he had this harem of wives and concubines, and that's why he had that many kids. Abimelech was not a judge appointed by God. He did not deliver Israel from invaders, as previous leaders did that we've studied. Abimelech was instead an opportunist. And like we shall see in a few moments, he took power through violence and treachery. He's what some writers call the anti-judge, because nowhere does he even acknowledge God as Lord of Israel. And remember that the, the Jews, Israel, have been fighting external enemies up until this point, but now they're burdened with internal corruption, which is far more dangerous. Sibling rivalry, of course, has been going on since the beginning of time. He and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, and now we have Abimelech and his 70 brothers. Well, so what did he do? But he conspired to convince the people of Shechem at his own time to crown him king. And he promised to look out for their best interests when he consolidated his power. We were related, remember? Now, the Shechemites certainly knew this local son, but they did not know God. Their religion had evolved into a hybrid fusion of theism and idolatry. They mix the Jewish law with pagan practices. How do we know that? It tells us in the following verses. They gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Bereth. Let's just stop there for a moment. Baal Bereth. Quick reminder of what Baal, because I think it's important that we understand who or what this is. Remember that before the Hebrews entered into the promised land, the Lord warned them against worshipping the Canaanite gods. You see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 14 and 15. But Israel turned to idolatry anyway. Baal was the name of the supreme god worshipped in ancient Canaan, and the practice of Baal worship infiltrated Jewish religious life during the time of the Judges, as we saw earlier in Judges chapter 3. And it wasn't long before it just became totally widespread in Israel. The word Baal means Lord, and in general, Baal was a fertility god who was believed to 
enable the, the earth to produce crops and people to produce children. And different regions, they worship Baal in different ways. And Baal proved to be a very uh, adaptable god. Various areas emphasized one or another of his attributes and developed special doctrines of Baalism. For example, in Numbers 25, verse 3, it refers to Baal of Peor and later known as Baal of Bereth in Judges 8, 33. In other words, it became a localized deity. Now going back to our text, Judges 3, uh, 9, verse 4, it tells us that the Israelites were involved in worshipping Baal of Bereth, which literally means the Baal of the Covenant. You see, the Israelites were supposed to be in a covenant relationship with God, but they had rejected God and embraced a pathway of self-destruction. They were not in a covenant relationship with Baal. And because of that, there's a lesson for all of us to be learned. And it's this. Autonomy is a lie. We will never rule our own lives. If we're not willing to be governed by God, we will be ruled by oppressors of one kind or another, he says, one shape or form. Abimelech's claim to the throne was on the basis of being the son of Gideon. And of course, you remember that Gideon had been offered the kingship. But the motive for his ambition was not to serve the people, but to gain and secure power. As a son of Gideon, his name meant, my father is king. And Abimelech felt that he might take the throne that his father declined. There are many other contenders, but Abimelech, he had his plan. Go back to verse 4. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Bereth. And Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Ophrah, and one stone murdered his 70 brothers, the sons of Jeroboam. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, escaped by hiding. Then they rounded up the 70 brothers and had them brutally and publicly executed. Yes, he was inspired by his father to be in Israel, but he revealed his hatred towards his father by murdering his brothers. He wanted to be king at any cost, and he wasn't going to let anyone stand in his way. But as we see, there was one brother who he didn't murder, Jotham. Jotham escaped, and he went and he addressed the people of Shechem on top of Mount Gerizim by sharing with them a really interesting fable. I want to look at that together. It starts at verse 8 to, to 15. One day the trees went, this is uh, again Jotham speaking, one day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree answered, should I give up my oil, by which both gods and humans are honored, to hold sway over the trees? Next the tree said to the, tree said to the fig tree, come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, should I give up my fruits? So good and so sweet to hold sway over the trees. Then the tree said to the vine, Come and be our king. But the vine answered, Should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and humans to hold sway over trees? Finally, the tree said to the thorn bush, Come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, If you really anoint, want to anoint me king over you, Come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Jotham's name means God is blameless, honest, and filled with integrity, which is the absolute opposite of Abimelech, who rejected all that is holy. 
Jotham's fable is about three valuable trees near the Israel, near the Israel me, which are offered kingship that they refuse. However, Thornbush accepts the position with a provision. He replies, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. Of course, the thorn bush represents a middle leg. And I don't know about you, but I believe it would be quite impossible to seek shade or comfort or protection from a thorn bush. Jotham continues to drive home his point in verse 19. So, have you acted honorably and in good faith towards Jeroboam and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy, and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Bethlehem, below. And let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Bethlehem, and consume Abimelech. Jotham wanted the people to know that it would be madness to make such a wicked man their king. And if they did, and if they were continuing to reject God and embrace this path of self-destruction, then they would reap the consequences and suffer ruin underneath his rule. Now you may wonder, why did God's people let this happen? Well friends, if you spend too much time in the world and in the presence of wickedness, you will ultimately become like them. There are times when we think that we can change people purely by our conduct and by our speech if we spend enough time with them. But if you have a barrel full of rotten apples and you put a good apple into that barrel, the good apple is not going to turn those bad apples good over a period of time. No, the bad apples will instead corrupt the good one. Proverbs 12, 16. Fools show, them, show their annoyance at once, but the fruit will become an insult. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffer harm. And Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good. Character. You see, God's people had become Canaanites in their character. Rather than standing for God, they broke their covenant with Him and adjusted to the value of the godless culture that was around them. We have to be on our guard against being shaped by our culture that's around us. Especially those when in our cultural leadership, our cultural elite, whether it be politicians, celebrities, musicians, sports stars, whatever it is, whenever they do not model godly behavior. Now let me ask you, do the Abimelechs of the world continue to reign today? Well, they certainly have in the recent past. Adolf Hitler for example, like him, like he and his father, and rose to political power by eliminating opponents by making deals and power structures. And it was only after he attained control that some people gradually realized just how evil he was. When leaders serve self and reject God, it feels like evil is in control and that God is somehow absent or he doesn't care. We wonder if and when we will be delivered, and how we will ever recover. We may even wonder why God seems to be doing nothing about certain situations that we see around the world. The early Native Americans had a unique practice of training their younger braves. On the night of the boy's 13th birthday, after learning hunting and scouting and fishing skills, he was put to one final test. He was placed in a dense forest at night, the entire night to spend alone. You see, until then, he had never been away from the security and 
comfort and warmth of his family and the shrine. But on this night, blindfolded and taken miles away into the dense forest, and then when he was allowed to take off his blindfolds after a period of time, in the middle of these thick woods, total darkness, terrified. Every time the twigs snapped, he visualized a wild animal ready to pounce. And after what seemed like an eternity, dawn begins to break. The first rays of sunshine finally penetrates that dense forest. And from being around, the boy begins to see flowers, trees, and the outline of a path. And then to his utter astonishment, there is a man armed with a cross with a bow and arrow, figure standing just a few feet away from his vision. And it was his father. He had been there guarding over him the whole night long. In times of confusion, when we feel isolated, when we feel alone, when we feel lost in the darkness, that he terrified of what could potentially be there, remember that God, our Heavenly Father, is right there with us. He's next to us. It's during those times of evil ruling that our God is still sovereign. You've got to remind yourselves of this. He's sovereign over human events which move according to his timetable. I remember recently speaking to a dear friend of mine who was really worried about certain situations that are happening around our world right now conflicts, and the struggles economically, and the shortages, and so forth, and the sinfulness. And I thought of this hymn, This is my father's world. This is my father's world. Let me never forget that though the wrong seems not so strong, God is the ruler yet. The rest of our chapter in Judges reveals Jotham's prophetic fable comes true, it comes to pass. God raises up opposition to Abimelech. He sort of divides and conquers his, his dark alliance that Abimelech built up for himself. They start infighting and speaking against each other. And Jotham stated that fire would come from the thorn bush and consume the people. And look with me at verse 49. So all the men cut branches and followed them. They piled them against the stronghold and set it on fire with the people still inside. So all the people in the tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women, also died. Jotham's fable was fulfilled. The Shechemites certainly and so sadly Read the consequences of this path of evil for choosing such an evil thing. It's perfectly proportionate retribution. And the same goes for Abimelech, who was handed over to the same violence that he inflicted on his brothers. Abimelech went to the tower and attacked it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head his skull. Hurriedly he called to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me, so that they can't say a woman killed him. So a servant ran him through, and he died. So just as Abimelech's conspiracy depended on the support of his mother's family and the slaughtering of his brothers on a stone, Abimelech's death ultimately came from the hand of a woman using a stone. A perfectly proportional retribution for his crimes. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 24, he tells us that God's judgment is seen when he hands us over to our sinful desires. Like a bit like, once we devote ourselves to the gods of this world, we should not expect mercy, but slow and brutal and inevitable justice. The way we dishonor God, the way we harm others, returns to us in perfect proportionality. 
Uh, this is good news for those of us who experience despicable evil. Our tormentors will be poetically repaid for the harm that they have done to us. But ominously, we are still under Jotham's warning. Just as the citizens of Israel rejected Gideon's sons, we reject God's leadership. We pledge unquestioned allegiance to the idols of greed, power, and pride, and sex. Like people like trust and violence, we trust our desires that they will secure for us our safety and happiness that we seek. As Jotham warned, we should not be surprised if those things curve back around and punish us with brutal proportionality. God is just. He's also rich in mercy. He sends another judge to his unfaithful and undeserving people. It's Jesus. Jesus, unlike Abedalite, is the rightful king of his people. But Jesus doesn't get what he deserves. He gets what we deserve. Jesus allows our evil to curve back on him. And instead of a coup, Jesus absorbs the judgment that we deserve. In an act of willing and humble sacrifice, he ends the retribution that we earn and justifies everyone who accepts his lordship of their life. Romans 3. God, Romans 3. 25 and 26. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Through the shedding of his blood, we received by faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus is the only Lord worthy of our allegiance. He welcomes us into his kingdom. But the only thing left for us is his mercy. I pray that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to see the God who repays evil proportionately and fairly. May you see Jesus as the one who absorbs what we deserve and gives us only mercy. Song playing for us is I exalt thee. Let's do that today in our hearts. Let's exalt Him and lift Him up as Lord of our lives.